Okay, for me to begin or? Just one second. Okay. Daisy got bumped out, we're getting her back in. <clears throat> make it easy for you, Gabriella. Don't worry. Okay, so for the translators, as usual, I don't have prepared notes that I've sent you. So I'll send them onto the Zoom forum, so please make sure that you're on that forum. And I hope it's going to be okay for you. I appreciate everything you've done for us. We won't let you... So I'm just waiting for someone to tell me to begin, by the way. Yeah, just one more minute. I apologize. That's fine. Just as long as you know I'm not waiting. Uh, sorry, you're not waiting for me. Okay, I think we're set. We're ready when you are. Welcome, everybody. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your continued mercy and goodness towards us. We, who are your erring children, yet you continually show and pour out your love upon us. We thank you for the great privilege of being able to gather together in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm assuming we're ready to go. Yes, ready. So I want to
begin our studies with some thoughts from someone that I um, I discovered. This person um, is part of the LGBT community. And they want to give their perspective of things. Vor să ofere perspectiva lor asupra lucrurilor. Yes. So this person's story begins in 2005. Elder Tess has done two presentations so far. And if you have watched her second presentation, which I hope you have, she's beginning to lay out the history of the line of the 144,000. but from a different perspective, a new perspective. A new story. Now, I believe she got up to around the year 2003. I think that's where she got up to, and she'll continue, I presume, in her next presentation. Sorry, oh, 2001. Okay, so I've just been told it was 2001. So I'm going to jump a few years ahead. It's the year 2005. Now we know that there are 50 states in, in the United States. And this story, or this portion of the story in 2005, Focus is on the state of Kansas. And I'm going to say Kansas is, is, is right in the middle of the United States. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. But in 2005, there was a constitutional amendment now all of us know what the constitution of the united states is so you're all familiar with that now that constitution that you've all heard speakers or teachers talking about is the federal document. Now, I hope we all know what a federation is. A federation is an organization that's composed of individual groups that come together. So, a federation or a federal state 
is composed of groups of people or bodies that come together in unity. So you might think about the board of one of your ministries or the board in the church that you used to go to. And what do you know about those boards, those federations? There has to be some agreement for the members to all come together. But what do you often find? that they disagree with one another on many things. So I want to suggest that the United States, that one federation, is composed of 50 countries. We call them states. So the reason why I'm calling them countries is that each one has its own government, its own legislature. Has its own police and even its own military. And then what the United States do is on top of those 50 governments with all their bureaucracy. They have a federal layer that has all the same components. A federal government a federal legal system, a federal police system, and a federal army. So I hope none of that is new to you. As I said, the constitution that you have heard speakers talking about is the federal constitution. What you may not be aware of is that each state, each of those little countries, has their own constitution. Now, we have, I'm going to say, three things. We have the government. And the government has its own three branches, if I say it that way. Say the the lower house, the upper house, and the president's office. The lower house, the upper house, and the president's office. but that's just the government. Then you have a legal system. We'll call it the Supreme Court. That's the highest court of the land. And those two bodies are supposed to work together. One of the bodies, the government, make law.
and they can make any law they want to, anything they want. Then you have the Supreme Court. And they're supposed to be the guardians. So they're the guardians of the United States. And I said there were three components. Government, the legislature. Now I'm gonna suggest the third one is the constitution. And what the judiciary are going to do is the following. They can't make law. They can't just say, oh, we like this law and we hate this law. So the job of the judiciary, those Supreme Court judges, is to check they're checkers. What they're going to check is the following. They'll take a law and they will cross-reference that against the Constitution. And they will say, this law agrees with the Constitution or this law disagrees with the Constitution. So the question is, what is the highest authority in the United States? So you already know the answer now. It's not the president. And it's not the Supreme Court judges. It's the Constitution. Now, this is vitally important for you to understand. Everything gets cross-referenced back to the Constitution. The Constitution is not law. The Constitution is above law. So when you have the Constitution, you cannot cross the will of the Constitution. It has supreme authority. So I hope we're all clear on this point. Now, I've just spoken about the federal system. President, Supreme Court. But do you know they have a Supreme Court, 50 of them, Each state has their own Supreme Court. And what's that court going to do? They're going to check the state laws against the state constitution. The highest authority is the state constitution. It's not, it's not the boss of the state. We'll call it the governor. It's not the Supreme Court judges of that state. Okay, so now we've understood that. 
in 2005, Kansas, Kansas are going to do something that I'm going to say is tricky. Very clever, very sneaky. It all looks straightforward when you read it. They want to make an amendment to the Constitution. Now, the amendment that they want to make agrees with the current law. Okay, so let me go through that again. Kansas has a law. It's on the law books. So it's legal. What they want to do, they say that's not enough. We want to change the Constitution of Kansas. so that the constitution agrees with the law. But why would they want to do that for? You should all know the answer. So we'll talk about another story, a general one. 2 people have a fight, legal fight. They go to court, one wins, one loses. The loser says, I don't like the result. What's the answer? You can't say tough luck. They have a system in the United States called the appeal system. So the Constitution is above everything. When they created that country, they created a Constitution. It was all agreed. So when they start creating laws, all the laws are subservient to the Constitution. They have to obey the Constitution. So I hope everybody's OK with my sound because I've been told it's cutting out, but people's my translator's sound is cutting out to me. OK. So I hope I've answered that question. The law is subservient. It's below the Constitution. The judges are below the Constitution. Everyone is below the Constitution. The Constitution is above everything. So two people have a fight. They're going to win and lose. The one who loses is going to go to the appeal court. They're going to make an appeal. They don't like the original answer. They lose that appeal case. Now, at this stage, you have to be rich. Or you have to have a large GoFundMe account. Because now 
when you lose at the appeal court, there may be some intermediate steps. But now you can take this to the Supreme Court. And if you take it to the Supreme Court, it's very expensive. But you send the paperwork in, you file your case. And the Supreme Court will decide if they would accept your case or if they will not accept your case. If they say we're not listening, then you have to abide by the lower court's results. It, if they agree to listen to your case, then they will decide if you win or lose based upon their understanding of the Constitution. Now, those Supreme Court judges have an obligation. So when we talk about Obama's judges, or we talk about Clinton's judges, or we talk about Trump's judges, Obama, Clinton, Trump. In theory, all of that is meaningless. Because all those judges are supposed to do is read the Constitution, understand what it says, and say, this case agrees or disagrees with the Constitution. But these judges, they're like Christians, like you and us, you and me. If I open a Bible verse, none of us can agree on anything. Why can't we agree? Because we have a different methodology. And so these judges all have different methodologies of understanding and interpreting the Constitution. So you want to write the Constitution really, really clearly. So question, can you change? Sorry, no. Can you challenge a law? The audio is not very good at my end. I hope other people aren't having problems. So can you, it comes in and out. So I don't, I don't think it's into that. I think it's a technical problem. So my question is, can you challenge a law? Yes, you can. Can you challenge the constitution? No, you cannot. So in 2005, what we're seeing is the Kansas, we'll call it the Kansas government, they want to change the constitution so that it comes in agreement with an existing law. And now you know why they're doing it. Because if they change the Constitution, if they amend it. You can't challenge it. 
So I want us to understand this legal issue. It's very important. At a federal level, it's very, very difficult to change the constitution. We call it an amendment. You've all heard about the amendments. So, 2005, Kansas. Now in Kansas, I don't know if it's in other states, the government can't just change the constitution. They have to have what at least we call in the UK a referendum. That means all the people vote. So in order for the government to amend the constitution, there's going to be a referendum. The ballot papers go out. I think you call them, I call it ballot papers. I'm not sure what you would call it. The paper that you tick. So the ballots all go out and it says on there, do you want to amend the constitution or not? I think it's 70% say yes. So I'm going to go with 70% say yes, we'll change it. Okay, so the existing law says the following. It's against the law to have same sex marriage. I live in Kansas. I don't like that law because I'm homosexual or I agree with LGBTQ rights. So I'm going to take the Kansas government to court. I can do that. And what I have to prove is what? That the law is unconstitutional. In America, everybody can take anybody to court. It's a good system. So there's a there's a law there in Kansas. I don't like the law, so I'm going to take them to court. And I have to prove that that law is unconstitutional according to Kansas to the Kansas Constitution. So keep with me. What does the government have to do? It's easy. Before I take them to court, they say, I know what we'll do. Let's change the constitution. So I can't take them to court now. Well, I can. I like wasting my money, so I'm going to take them to court. I'll say this law is wrong, bad. 
and they'll say, who said it's bad? And I said, well, I think it's bad. And they say, we don't care what you think. We care what the Constitution says. And what does the new Constitution say? You cannot have same-sex marriage. An amendment to the Constitution. Now, I hope no one here is from Kansas or has an affinity to Kansas. But the government of Kansas is does a does a really bad job of governing its people. It's a mess. OK, so this is the introduction to this. This perspective of this person. The 2005 Constitutional Amendment in Kansas. Now you probably haven't heard of this before. Because Kansas is not on many people's radar. There are other states that are more famous. Plus, this is not the only state that's doing this. Okay, so I want to break away from these thoughts and introduce something, it's all connected, but something new. So this is going to be a little bit of reading now. OK, so I'm going to cut and paste this onto the Zoom forum. So um, I think there are five little sections. I'll, I'll put them all now first, and then we'll talk about them in a moment. And I'll, I'll explain these to you in a moment. Those of you who are just um, part of the, the congregation, I'm sure Summer will, will post this up for you. OK, so these are the five sections. So what I've posted uh, for you is the following. It's the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, the 14th, 
Oh, for my translator. So just a brief review of the amendments. So the first 10 amendments were not really amendments. They called them the Bill of Rights. So I've discussed this before. Remember our little analogy about the board members. Some people are more independently minded than others. They don't like being told what to do. Think about a member in the church when the board tells them what they have to do. They don't like it. If you're like me, you just do what you're told. Now don't laugh, it's true. Okay, so this is my understanding of the amendments. Amendments 101. The Constitution is the federal document. And it gives wide sweeping power to the Federation, the federal government. And the leaders of the states, some of them, they said, we're not going to accept that. We already got rid of one king from England. We're not having another one. Because the Constitution makes the president the king of the United States. So they said, in English, they use the phrase, we need to clip his wings. That means that they need to limit his power, clip his wings, limit his power. I want to remind you that from 2016 to 2020, We saw that those people who worried about the Constitution and creating a king called a president, whatever measures they took in the amendments didn't work very well. Look how easy it is for the United States president to do whatever they want. When I watched what was happening in the United States, it was like watching a movie about 16th century England. The king can do no wrong and no one can stop the king. Back to our story. An amendment is there to limit federal power. It's also there to protect the rights of the individual. From who? 
the federal government. Okay, so that's my brief, simple explanation of what the amendments are there for, to protect the state, to protect the individual against the federal government. The federal government. We call it the Constitution. Now, everyone has their own opinion. I'm going to give you mine. The 14th Amendment is the most important amendment. Everything clusters around the 14th Amendment. It all happens at the 14th. Also, I believe that the 14th Amendment is the longest one, it's got the most words. Some trivia. Trivial information, trivia. Do you know how many, const how many constitutional amendments have been proposed? Eleven thousand. But only twenty seven have been ratified. I think it's twenty seven out of eleven thousand. And I'm going to say the 14th is the most important. So I just want to briefly speak about what this amendment is about. As I said, there's five sections. We can ignore the, the last section, section five, because all it says is that the government, Congress, has the power to enforce this amendment by writing proper laws. So that's all that section five says, so there's four sections. Section one is the, is the main part of this amendment. It has three sections to it. The citizen section about citizens. The due process section. I'll explain what each of these mean. And then the, and then the equal protection part. Section one has got three parts to it. Citizenship. Due process. Due process means how the legal system treats you. That's what due process means.
and equal protection or equal rights. Citizenship. Due process. And equal protection. So I'm going to give you the date for the 14th Amendment. It was passed by the government, Congress, June 13th, 1866. Just after the Civil War. Remember what the clauses are about. Citizenship, due process, equal protection. Just after the war, you can see why these issues are important. Takes two years for it to be ratified, to go into law. July 9th, 1868. So let's summarize. We're talking about the 14th Amendment. It's passed in 1866 is ratified in 1868. Just after the Civil War. It's going to deal with three main issues. Citizenship. If you get into trouble, you can go to court. It's your right. You have a right to go to court. It's called due process. If you've watched American movies and they say, read him, read the person their rights. They say you have the right to this thing. You have the right to that thing. You have a right to a lawyer. Anything you say will be used against you. You're not allowed to incriminate yourself or you can't be forced to incriminate yourself. This is called due process. Most civilized countries have this. And the last one is equality. Equal protection. So it's number 14. And of course, either side of it is number 13 and number 15. And we'll talk about them in a moment. OK, so I've already said that I think the 14th Amendment is the most important one. It's the longest one. It's got the most words. So I'm going to we may read the Constitution. Amend, sorry, we may read the sections of the amendment, but I want to give a paraphrase here. OK, so this is section one paraphrased. It's 
It's going to define what citizenship is. The, I'll read it all, then it can be translated. The 14th Amendment gives an important definition of citizenship. It says that anyone born in the United States is a citizen and has the rights of a citizen. This was important because it ensured that the freed slaves were officially United States citizens. And they were given or awarded the rights that every US citizen has. He then says, once you become a citizen, no one can take that from you. So that's section one about citizenship. Now, the next bit is really important. Section one, the requirements of the states. Before the 14th Amendment was passed, the Supreme Court said that the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, only applied to the federal government. They didn't apply to the state governments. In the 14th Amendment, it says that the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, in fact, do apply to the state governments. So this may seem very technical, but it becomes vital because today, the 14th Amendment is being used. This is the key amendment. That's why I think it's the most important. And one of the things that made it significant was all those amendments, the first 10 that were applied, when they were applied to amend the Constitution, the 14th Amendment clarifies one important point. It said that the Supreme Court was doing something wrong before. You see the, pa you see the power of the Constitution in its amendments? It says you have to interpret, this is you, the Supreme Court, you have to interpret you have to interpret the amendments also at the state level, not just federal level. Now without going into any technical things, Which famous fight did you see between the states and their rights and the federal government and its power? What year? 
2015. So this 14th Amendment becomes critical in, becomes critical in understanding the relationship between the states and the federal government. The next one, still section one. Privileges and immunities. So you have a privilege and you have immunity. The amendment guarantees that the states cannot take away the privileges or immunities of citizens. So the federal constitution gives you some rights and the states cannot take them away. They can't write their own laws or their own constitution that overrides the federal constitution. Where did this come in? Same issue, 2015. 2015 was same-sex marriage for those of you who were not sure. This means that there are some rights that the state governments cannot touch. They can't take certain rights away from you. Bill section one, due process. The amendment guarantees due process of law by the state government. As I said, due process means your legal rights. Now, I'm assuming if you're American, you know the answer to my next question. Due process is not something new. It comes up in another amendment, an earlier one. Number five. So in amendment number five, it talks about a person's rights to due process. Remember, due process means how the law treats you. In the 14th Amendment, due process is at the state level. In the 5th Amendment, due process was at the federal level. Yes. You asked me in French or I don't know. Section one, equal protection. The amendment also guarantees equal protection of the laws. This is important. It was put there to make sure that every person 
regardless of age, race, religion, would be treated the same way by the government. That's the equal protection bit. Section two. The House of Representatives. Section two of the amendment describes how the states, how the sorry, how the yeah, how the states would send people into government. I have spoken about this before, and Sister Kathy McGraw has done a presentation, at least one, on this issue. This is about state representation. How the states send their representatives, uh, their members of government, the federal government, to Congress. It's all about numbers. Well, say simply, the more people in the state, the more members of government that you can send. Common sense. So this section is going to talk about how you count the people. Now, if you don't live in America, you don't understand what I'm talking about. Because you might say, don't Americans know how to count? It's got nothing to do with that. So they want to send people to the House of Representatives because they're going to represent their state. Now, I know you all know this next bit. During the era that, sorry, the era of slavery, slaves were counted as three fifths of a person. Now, people have manipulated this into the following ideology. They say that in America, black people were considered to be three fifths of a human being or three fifths compared to a white person. But of course, those of us who have looked at this, I'm not saying it's not ugly, it is, it's racist. but it's a function of a slave economy. This is an economic issue. In the slave states, they had so many slaves. If they counted them as individuals, and in fact, the slave states wanted to count them as one person, one black person, one white person, they're the same. It's the people that were against slavery that wanted to call them three fifths. Because what would happen in 
is in the states that have slaves, the population would be so large. They'd be able to send more representatives. And in the House of Representatives, there would be an imbalance. More members of government from the southern states than the northern states. So no more slavery, free movement of people. Everyone is counted as an individual person. Section three, about rebellion. Anybody that's participated in rebellion against the government cannot hold an office in government. And this is important at the state or the federal level. Have you heard something about rebellion against the government recently? Like this year. They would have used the 14th Amendment on this issue. So section four says that anybody who was a slave farmer before will not receive any help. I've already said that section three about rebellion That means anybody who was involved in the Civil War was not allowed to hold a government office at the state or federal level. This is a wonderful amendment. It's really good. We're running out of time. So all I want to say now in closing is the following. Well, I haven't finished talking about the 14th Amendment. I want to speak a little bit more about it. There have been important court cases. And the 14th Amendment has been the main argument or the main point where people have focused their attention in these court cases. And the most important part where all these cases have come have been have used the 14th Amendment is on the following phrase. Equal protection under the law. So some of these you have heard of and some you may not have heard of. Number one. Brown versus Board of Education. So you heard of this one. This was used in the 14th Amendment.
basically uh, that was about racial discrimination if you don't know what it was about board of education means the school system number two roe versus wade We've all heard of that one about reproductive rights. This used the 14th Amendment. Bush, Bush versus Gore. Bush versus Gore. This was about election recounts. The 14th Amendment was pivotal in that case. Two you may not have heard of. Reed versus Reed. And that was about gender discrimination. And the last one was the University of California versus, I think it's pronounced back or bake. And this is to do with racial quotas in higher education. Again, without the 14th Amendment, none of these um, five cases that I've given to you would have been able to be litigated. So we've run out of time. We've run out of time. And I just want to remind us the 14th Amendment. It deals with citizenship. Due process. and equal protection under the law. They're all in section one, that's vitally important. And I've given you five famous cases, um, three that you all know about for sure, that used the 14th Amendment Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We pray that you would help us. Help us to understand the American legal system. Help us to see how the amendments have protected your people. And they have been used to shield and defend the truth. We thank you for the privileges that they have afforded your people. In Jesus' name, amen.